Human is about sharing stories of life, faith and humanity. And each evening this week I've been interviewing different individuals and they've been sharing parts of their story. And after that we've been hearing from Mark about a story that Jesus told. And tonight I'm so excited. We've got Nikki. Nikki um, is a former Durham student and now um, founded and directs Refuge, which is a, a social enterprise. And we are going to hear part of her story tonight. So let's give a warm welcome to Nikki. <laughs> welcome, Nikki. You currently live in Durham. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I, yeah, I live in Neville's Cross in Durham. Uh, I was uh, a student in f at Durham uh, in 2000, from 2009 to 2012. Um, and yeah, now I, I run a social enterprise called Refuse, which we've already talked about. So, um, and I live uh, with a whole load of fantastic people um, in a kind of community house in Durham. Wonderful. And so what was your college and course when you were at Durham? Uh, I did natural sciences and I was at Collingwood. Nice. And my, my question I asked when we chatted earlier was, this was pre-flat white days, just, <laughs> she's not that old. Um, how was that? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even think that was a thing that students do these days. Um, but flat white's great. Uh, what was it like before flat white? I don't know. I didn't really go for coffees. I was... Uh, I was far too involved in all of the student stuff, like theatre and partying, probably. Fair enough. Good answer. Um, and tell us a little bit about Refuse, for those who don't know what, what that is. Um, yeah, Refuse is a social enterprise that is uh, campaigning against food waste. So we um, do a huge amount of uh, working with supermarkets and campaigning and running uh, social media campaigns and all sorts of things, um, talking about the criminal levels of food that is wasted in the UK. Um, and we, uh, we work to feed bellies, not bins. So we go around and collect food from supermarkets and retailers and anywhere and everywhere, uh, he, about a tonne a week of food that is, is otherwise going to be wasted. And we, with it, we put on events, we do catering, we do pop-up restaurant events once a month in Durham and um, we run a schools project educating kids about food uh, and we uh, also run an app called Olio which hopefully some students might have got involved in over the last year and um, so yeah loads of different things that we are doing to campaign against food waste um, and to, to give value to things places and people that would otherwise um, be seen as worthless. How exciting. We are going to, um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that later, but I want to um, go back to pre-Durham days and ask you just a little bit about your childhood being brought up. What was that like? Did you have any understanding of faith when you've been brought up? Um, I had a great childhood. I grew up in Guernsey. Is there any Guernsey people nice. here today? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a great place to grow up, uh, and I uh, no had no no faith. Um, I had a great upbringing, fantastic parents that taught me a lot about adventure and um, about kind of ambition and the world being my oyster. Um, and yeah, but but no, nothing to do with faith um, apart from going to church at Christmas with my granny once every now and then. And if at this age, when you were maybe a teenager, I was to ask you, who is Jesus to you? What would you have said? Um, I wouldn't have had a clue, I think. I, uh, I, yeah, I would have said faith is a... Christianity seems to be a nice thing, and people that I have seen that are Christians seem to be nice. But, yeah, I wouldn't have had any answer to who Jesus was at all. So you, you came to Durham, uh, no faith, no understanding of Jesus outside maybe Christmas um, church. Did you ever question whether there was more to life? Did that ever cross your mind? Um, uh, on my corridor, there were two or three um, people who were really committed Christians, part of the CU. Um, and so it was asked of me a few times when I was in first year. Um, and I think my answer was, um, it seems like a nice thing to have faith um, and and it's it's nice to have um, a hope for when you die um, but I it was a bit kind of irrelevant to me and um, uh, I was a scientist studying natural sciences and uh, I did couldn't see how it was kind of relevant to the 21st century really um, it seemed like a history books thing 
And this will start to change when you're in second year. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so at the start of second year, I um, I got to, to, to Durham a, a week early. Um, and so I was on my own in my house and uh, it was a Saturday night and I just decided I wanted to go to church the next day. Um, it was a very kind of spontaneous decision and uh, I didn't think much of it. I just sort of wanted to see what it was like. And I knew that my friends who were on my corridor would have... Um, been pleased to hear that I, want, I wanted to go to church. Um, so, yeah, I just um, went along. And uh, it was, I was, I was deeply moved, um, like crying in the, in the, in the worship. And um, I, yeah, I didn't really know what to make of it. I just, it was just felt like it was um, talking about stuff that was really deep and, and talking kind of deep in my soul about sort of moving my soul, I think, um, about, because it was stuff that I just hadn't really ever thought about or, or understood. Um, and I kind of, it was sort of challenging me to think, actually, you know, these questions about what life's about and, and why we're here and who we are um, uh, are really important and actually aren't irrelevant. And I've got to have, I've got to have an idea of, of what I think the, those answers might be um, and whether that is there's a God or there isn't. I've got to have an idea and, and a... And a, and a way to explain that. So um, I did, uh, it just so happened that two weeks later, um, there was an alpha course starting, um, which is where they had, we went every Thursday and had a meal together and watched um, a talk uh, about Jesus and who he was and, um, and some big questions about the Bible and uh, the historicity of the Bible and... Um, just all sorts of things like that, like basically a guide to Christianity. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot from it. Um, but I kind of left, yeah, left with an intellectual understanding of, of Jesus and was really attracted to that, but um, kind of carried on uh, kind of uni life throughout second year, reading a lot and um, trying to work out what I thought of it all but not kind of making any commitments because I was still still had a lot of big questions um yeah uh, uh no, my question um <laughs> looking back do you know why you were why you decided to you wanted to go to church like did you know what you were searching for or was it just out of general interest um I think it was just starting to have those like bigger questions why am I here um what's what's my purpose in life and um what does it mean to be human and uh that kind of thing and and I think there was there was you know um sickness in my family as well my grandparents were ill so it's taught a bit of thinking about what happens when you die and that kind of thing I think was was the the sort of first reason why I started go, or why I wanted to go to church that first time yeah so you go to church you do this alpha course and then you can sort of continue your second year. Uh, does anything change? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, so second term of, uh, this term of second year, I, um, I went to church every now and then, um, not, not co- like consistently and to lots of different churches. Um, and I, I read a lot of books and I started reading the Bible, uh, started kind of, experimenting with praying um but all very like um on my own and uh I didn't really like I didn't want to talk to it about it with with people because uh I still had these like massive questions and I felt like if anyone asked me I'd have to have all the answers um uh so yeah I kept it all to myself um and then just uh again I came back to Durham a week early in Easter term uh and I well, actually, just before that, I'd, I had a bus journey um, with my now best friend um, who uh, it was like a nine hour bus journey back to Durham because I was a poor stu- back to London because I was a poor student, couldn't afford train fares. Um, and uh, and we talked in that on that journey about um, about God being a God of love um, and about kind of what it means to be a Christian above like just believing in God and that it meant that we were people of love and that we were compassionate and that um, that meant like that should influence how we live our lives and um, and kind of, yeah, our politics, like everything in life because it's, 
we know and we uh, we have a God of love. Um, so that was that was a really impact like it impacted me a lot that that big nine hour bus journey. Um, and then when I came back to Durham, I went to church with him, um, and uh, and it was yeah it was on a Sunday where they were talking about God being a God of love and um, about. Uh, kind of they were equating um being a christian to being uh, in a marriage relationship and um and how you can't really say um if someone asks you are you married you can't really say sort of and sometimes uh and if i feel like it but actually that it's like you're committing to each other and that god commits to you um and says that he loves you no matter what and he'll always be with you so it was that was like that really again moved me uh, and I, I really kind of started to understand and feel um, a, a God that wanted to be in a relationship with me and um, who wanted to tell me that he loved me and that he would never leave me. Um, and I think I still had like loads of questions um, and I still didn't feel like I would be able to answer them if someone asked me, but uh, I felt like I needed to, this was like, this was quite a massive thing um, and I needed to give it my all or say I don't want anything to do with it. I couldn't just sit on the edge anymore. So, um, so yeah, I sort of, I remember messaging my friends being like something really cheesy, <laughs> like, um, so I'm ready to say that he's like my fiance, but I don't actually want to get married to him <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like it was like a journey basically, and I think I started it at that point, but it's massively still a journey now. Um, but yeah, definitely a time of knowing that that God loves me, and that even though I've still got questions and probably have more questions now than I did then, um, God is there and He loves me, and that's. That's what I knew then, and I still know now. So you sort of went on a journey and then decided that something either needed to change you the way, and you decided to say yes, that relationship with Jesus. How did that change your life? Um, did friends see that difference in you as well, family, all of that? Um, yeah, in some ways, yeah. But again, it's a journey. Um, I think I was really, like... Uh, scared to tell um, friends and family and and work out because work out how to say it and and work out how to answer questions that they had. Um, I think looking back, I wish I'd taken them on the journey with me and and I'd sort of told them my doubts as well as what I was learning. Um, uh, but I think yeah, uh, it it definitely changed me and and made me uh, really excited. Kind of learning that uh, this God was not a God of like. Um, it wasn't like a theory and um, and a kind of history book thing, but um, was alive and was like challenging me and changing me and um, and and getting to meet some Christians as well that were um, in the student world and the student bubble that I was in. Um, I got to break out of that bubble and kind of meet uh, people from Durham and families and people who have lived lives uh, lives of faith and. Um, and that was just really cool as a as a third year student, particularly as I was like working out what the heck I was going to do with my life, um, uh, and and yeah, and just having conversations with, being really inspired by some amazing people who um, had very different conversations to the superficial type things that you have when you're a student, um, or that I had had anyway. Um, and these guys were talking about yeah, like slavery and climate change and what god thinks of that and just like loads of stuff that was just really exciting to me and uh and just changing my perspective i think of of life and what my purpose is for life and you, you said you still have lots of questions you had when you made that decision how did you sort of deal with that yeah still have questions definitely like probably more than i <laughs> than i used to uh, or i did then um but yeah definitely my my journey of of being a christian has been all about like uh learning and saying like that's almost part of my identity nikki is learning <laughs> like, um uh and i think i think i've i've learned over the years that it's uh almost just as important uh to have doubt as it is to have faith <laughs> um it, like saying i don't know is a really good thing sometimes and um uh yeah, I think it's really, really important to keep asking questions and to keep grappling with them, but um, but it's okay to say, I don't know. And 
so you then go into third year and finish uni. What does that look like? How does that decision for that relationship change? All of that. Um, so I did, I decided to, I'd kind of broken out of the student bubble um, whilst I was at uni in my third year and volunteering for a load of different local organisations and, and church things. Um, and I decided to commit to another year in the North East. Um, I felt like I'd got roots here. My granddad was a minor. Um, and I really wanted to just give, like, give a year to, to Durham because I, I could I just I could see the the beauty and the community and the life that there is in the northeast and um, but also the brokenness and and I wanted to kind of say I'm going to commit a year of my life to the northeast whatever that will do um, and here I am <laughs> seven years later or something um, but yeah and uh, and I uh, the year after that I lived in community and um, so we had there was a group of friends that were all at a similar kind of life stage all different churches um, and we uh, we all shared our dreams um, at, at an event and uh, we all kind of they they really matched each other they were all about radical hospitality reading um there's a bit in acts in the bible which is um a kind of book about the early church and there's a bit that describes um the the early kind of early believers fellowship of early believers um who eat together and share possessions and pray together every day and every day more join their numbers um and we loved that that passage and we kind of wanted to like we had all big dreams <laughs> of living like that. So saying like, we're going to live together, we're going to share everything, we're going to pray every morning, we're going to um, have a spare room downstairs where we house people that are homeless, um, we're going to yeah eat together and eat with anyone that we meet, and all this sort of thing. So we had this big dream of, of what it might look like to live in community. Um, and we learned a lot from that. <laughs> Do you have any funny stories? Definitely, yeah. So uh, we... Yeah, we how we had this spare room downstairs um, where we used to have we we were part of a charity called DePaul Night Stop where um, young people can stay um, as a kind of emergency stop gap um, if they found themselves without a roof over their heads and um, we had all sorts of people from like Romanian magicians uh, to a guy who did grime rap stuff from London uh, to. Oh, what else? A Nigerian, amazing Nigerian woman, um, and then we had this guy who um, who was 17 when he moved with us, and he'd come from homelessness, and um, he was supposed to stay for a weekend, and he ended up staying for five months, um, and he was amazing, uh, but very chaotic, and uh, and loved animals, and uh, oh, do I tell this story? <laughs> Yeah, fine. Um, he he uh, he went and uh, rescued a, a magpie from a tree, uh, which was a baby magpie, like a just-born magpie, which um, looked like a testicle with a beak. I want to say that. Um, uh, and it was kind of gross, and we fed it with dog food, and it made this like weird, horrible, squeaky noise. And uh, and we 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 loved this magpie a lot, um, and. Uh, it was horrible, but we all sort of got behind Chris because we really wanted, you know, him to feel loved. Uh, and and then uh, the magpie died <laughs> in the same week that, no, just a week after my grandma had died and uh, one of our housemates, good friends, had died. And it was all just a tragic, tragic time. And we were all grieving. And but the most grieving was happening for this magpie called Bobby which was found in the garden um, uh, and we had this like amazing funeral where like there was a student party going on down over the road playing blurred lines and Mim was reading the bible and uh, and we were like saying goodbye to this poor little magpie and it was all just like a very surreal moment wow <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun yeah um <laughs> was it ever hard having people definitely else? yeah massively yeah I learned so much about um about myself about uh grace and uh and having grace for myself and for others um I learned a lot about faith and um, one of our housemates got really ill with Emmy um which then lasted a number of years so we learned a lot about kind of 
unanswered prayer and and what faith looks like in a in a really rubbish situation where we can't see hope um uh i learned a lot yeah a lot about vulnerability and about um kind of sharing struggles with people and not being um an independent person but actually kind of saying being able to be like i can't do this alone and i've got to be with other people and like what community looks like with that um yeah it was a it was an amazing experience and i think the way that um yeah how how god works through community is amazing um and i also learned about god as well in a way that was surprising like i think we thought that um that it would be that god is like i don't know he's in beautiful places like this <laughs> that looks amazing but actually um god is uh is there in doing the washing up and um magpie funerals and like you know he's he's kind of he's messy and the way that um we love other people and we do um mission uh, is really messy and really hard sometimes as well and so you live in in a community house and in 2015 refuse comes about can you tell us about that yeah so from this house quite a few different projects came about which was yeah really cool to see um, and one of them was refuse and um, it was me and my my housemate uh, and best friend mim uh, and we were we, i was volunteering for a, cha- a charity called food cycle um, and i was learning a lot about food waste and um, reading about it um, and just being like why are these statistics and figures are crazy um we waste a third of the food that is produced for the uk is wasted um and and the environmental impact of that um was really i i really cared about because of i really care about climate change um and i yeah i was volunteering for this charity and it was great um, we would feed 20 to 30 people who were um quite a lot of homeless people and things like that um, and it was great and we'd sit down and eat with them with food that we'd collected from one local shop and uh, a green grocer and baker um, and I just couldn't help but think what happens uh, in the, this isn't enough what happens in the bigger supermarkets what happens further up the supply chain and um, we need to be making a song and dance about this so um, I, I did a, a course in social enterprise and um, and started refuse with um, a a pop-up restaurant event which was in the indoor market and we served about 250 people at an amazing restaurant event um, and people paid by playing music for us and doing caricatures and it was just a great atmosphere and and we've been doing pop-up events since then. Nice and how does your faith fit into your passion to see that culture of food waste change? Uh, Good question. Um, Well I said at the start, uh, our, the kind of vision statement of Refuse is um, to see p- people, places, and things, uh, to, to give value to people, places, and things that might otherwise be seen as worthless. Um, and the, the way that we do that in Refuse is, is pay as you feel. So um, that's the kind of central part of what we do. It says that um, when people come to our events, um, they are... Um, the, they're, they're challenged to value the food beyond um, what it's been wrongly deemed as worthless um, but it's value um, from the kind of the resources and the energy and the time and the water that's gone into making it and um, so we ask people to, to value that to revalue it um, but we also say that everyone that comes to our events has value way beyond the coins that are in their pockets so though they can pay in coins and, and we encourage that because we need to keep going um, they can also pay with their time and their skills um, and so we get like Paul the homeless guy playing piano for us for lunch um, and uh, yeah like I say people playing people doing the washing up for us and paying by sweeping up or uh, or even just sharing stuff about us on social media. You know, it's a, it's an amazing way and of making everyone equal. Um, so how my faith comes into that, I think, is that, um, like, I think that is a kind of a thing that I see about uh, Jesus and uh, and how he values everyone um, equally uh, and way beyond. Uh, the coins in their pockets obviously but but kind of he values people for for the unique skills and the time and gifts that they have and that God's given us um 
and and he challenges us to do that um, for everyone as well, to, to value everyone equally. And you've done lots of events. I've been to a couple. One of them I went to was a wedding. Can you tell us a little bit about catering for weddings? Yeah, yeah. We've done four weddings now, um, which I think is an amazing way of, of showing the value in, in this food that like you can think of food waste and think it's going to be you know, stuff that's a bit past its best. Um, but this is like, you know, huge amounts of really, really good quality food um, that just is heartbreaking to see it going towards the bin. Um, and yeah, to be able to do weddings just is such an honour. It make, it's, it's, yeah, it shows the kind of value. And, and we got on the BBC um, in the, for the first one um, on BBC News, which was really cool. Um, but it was a... We've learned a lot since that one. <laughs> was it quite a lot of pressure? <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, it's like catering for 150 people in a kind of ready, steady cook kind of situation where you don't know what you're going to get until the day, um, which is, yeah, crazy pressure. And we were the first one was in a, in a place where there was not a proper kitchen. Um, we plugged every... Like, everything was kind of plugged in. Um, and the rice cooker... We were like on <laughs> being filmed by the BBC uh, and Mim comes over and she's like, just keep stirring and smiling. But um, <laughs> the rice cooker's broken, so um, <laughs> the rice isn't cooked. <laughs> um, Did it go okay? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it was fine in the end. <laughs> good. Um, and what are the, the best and worst things of Refuse, of um, directing that? Um... You have to know everything. You have to be able to do everything. Uh, it's it's like kind of crazy. Uh, you have to be you know good from being able to cook vegan and gluten free canapes to like this week I've been putting together a cabinet and um, learning how to yeah I don't know learning how to put up plasterboard um, and like driving a Ford Transit van and. Yeah, social media. You have to you have to be able to do a lot of different things, um, which is really fun and actually like makes my job really varied and such a like you know it suits me down to the ground. But um, but it's hard work and a lot of pressure, so it's tiring. And how do you reconcile wanting to see so much change and having a, a heart for that and feeling like that dream is something that God has given you, with the difficulties that come with uh, running a social enterprise? Okay. Um, I don't know. I think... Say the question again. <laughs> <laughs> How do you reconcile um, having a passion for wanting to see the culture of food waste change and believing that that is what you're meant to do and what you want to do with the difficulties that come with wanting to see the culture of food waste change? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, I think I... It's a kind of... A, I think it's a grace thing. Um, I think it's a it's a thing of saying actually the problems in this world and like um, food waste is such a massive issue. It's like yeah, it's this one supermarket that we're talking to that could make some some really obvious changes, and we can work with them to do that. But actually, it's systemic um, and uh, kind of entrenched in the way that loads of different people do things. So like we can only make our mark um uh and but but i also think that like uh grace is is massive so like i don't know this is confusing uh i think like i think um we have to talk about like sin um and uh and that being like a personal thing but i also think that it's um quite a, it's a big it's a bigger thing than we think like it's um quite entrenched like it's it's in the systems and it's entrenched kind of thing but also that means that grace is huge uh and uh and way bigger than we think it's not just um an individual thing um and and so yeah i i think knowing that god is is a god that is uh so love the world and he's changing the world and he's changing those systems um and that he's asked us to be a part of it of of doing our little part is really cool um but also uh we can only do our little bit but i often think about um 
the story of the feeding the 5,000, where this little kid uh, goes, like, he's like, has anyone got food? And there's like 5,000 people out there wanting to be fed. Nobody has food. And this little kid um, steps forward and is like, I've got this. And uh, Jesus is, gives the bread to the disciples. It's like, go and feed them. And it's like the tiniest amount of bread. And I just kind of think, actually, I've just got this tiny amount of bread. Um, but if I step out in faith and know that Jesus is with me, that's going to multiply. Um, uh, and so I, I can just have that little bit. And whatever that is, if it's just like, you know, the small amount of energy that I have this morning or like um, the small passion that I have or the, the, the will that I know that this is wrong, something is wrong, that I really want to change it. Like that's a small thing and Jesus will multiply that and make it make, it make an impact. And you're currently stepping out in the new venture in Chesley Street with a cafe. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's really exciting. We're just about to open um, a cafe in Chesley Street, which is a community cafe. Um, we got to the point where we were just collecting so much, mo- so much food, we needed to feed more people. Um, but also we needed to have a hub in order to collect more food and feed more people. Um, so we, uh, we did a crowdfund campaign where we raised £15,000 um, to buy a van um, and give my little car a break um, and to, uh, to find a cafe space. And it's been a massive journey. It's taken a year to find a space and taken uh, about five months to renovate this amazing um, previously an empty shop um so it's about redeeming people and places um like it's it was an empty shop on on a high street which has quite a lot of empty shops but it, we've turned it into this beautiful amazing place with a whole load of volunteers um and amazing people that have got involved uh, and we're really close to opening we're hoping three or four weeks ish but um follow us on social media um to to find out when and come along please because uh yeah it's going to be a really cool cafe with lots of different creative stuff going on um supporting loads of different groups lots of um people getting involved to be able to learn volunteering skills and and gain skills towards employability um and we're going to do like creative nights and um, best before bistro events where we serve really fancy food um, that would otherwise be wasted. And the whole thing is going to be pay as you feel as well. So um, a really different cafe um, that I hope will be a bit of a hub of community and, and loads of stuff that goes on in Chester Street. It's really exciting. Exciting. Um, and for those people who are here and perhaps are exploring faith and grappling with some really big questions... Looking back over your time at Durham and since then, uh, what would you say to them? Um, I would say keep asking questions um, because they're really important questions to ask. And um, uh, yeah, and don't don't just like settle for 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 answer, like for easy answers. Just keep keep asking questions because I think. Yeah, they're really important. I think keep turning up. um, uh, When things are hard, keep turning up. um, And, yeah, probably, yeah, just, yeah, probably that's it. (laughs) That's good. Yeah. And my final question is, who is Jesus to you today? Oh, man, end on the hardest one. (laughs) No, Uh, no, who is Jesus to you today? Um... He is my inspiration. So I think he, um, what I read of him in the Bible is, uh, is someone that um, loves people outrageously, um, people that society don't love or reject. Um, and he is, yeah, amazingly outrageously compassionate. Um, and I am inspired by that and want to live like that um he is my fuel so i think he he kind of pushes me on um when i need pushing on he uh gives me peace and rest when i need that um he bails me out when i mess up uh he yeah he kind of keeps me going um and he's alive i think is the thing he he's not a god of uh history books and um and theology but actually he's well he is theology but and that's not a bad thing it's a good thing but it's just like he's 
he's he's kind of he's alive and exciting and teaching me things every day and um and bringing community together and uh and teaching me things through them uh and he's transforming lives and he's yeah transforming the world um for the good building his kingdom thank you so much let's give nikki a round of applause and Andrew is going to tell us about the next bit of the evening. Thank you so much, Nat and Nikki. Um, we'll now take a quick five-minute break. Do chat around with people around you. Um, we'll begin our second part shortly. So don't feel like you need to go anywhere, but five-minute short break. Great. Do grab a seat again. Um, we're going to carry on now um, by looking at a short story that Jesus told while he was on earth. Um, it's recorded in a book called Luke, a book of the Bible called Luke. Uh, you should have one either on your tables or on your chairs. Uh, it looks like that, a blue, blue book with uh, Luke on the front. And Luke uh, was someone who went around talking to eyewitnesses who saw and heard Jesus while he was on earth. And Luke compiled a biography of Jesus' life. And it's from that book that Andrea is going to read to us now. So if you'd like to pick up your copy um, and read along with her. If you have your little book, um, flip to page 49. It's page 49. If um, you have a different Luke, then flip until you see a big number 20. We're reading from chapter 20, from verse 9. So it's chapter 20, from verse 9. The parable of the tenants. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat it and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Thanks, Andrea. And Mark, if you'd like to come and join us up on the stage, uh, Mark's going to be helping us understand that bit of the Bible now. Um, hey, Mark, you doing all right? I am, thanks. Um, now, Mark, we've been finding a bit about you, um, out about you these evenings. We found out your... Um, living in Maidenhead, um, you spent time in Uganda, and that you're a chaplain at Whitehall. Mm -hmm. um, I've just got one question that I'd like to ask you. Can I cut your hair? No. <clears throat> I'll take that as a maybe. Over to, over to you, Mark. <laughs> we'll, we'll have words later. Thank you very much. Well, I'd love it if you kept that open. Uh, Luke 20, and uh, I think... Uh, what you can do then is make sure that what I'm saying uh, actually is based on what has uh, been written and uh, transferred down the centuries and held by Christians for, well, 2,000 years. And uh, if there are things that you object to, 
then we can talk about whether or not I've been fair to what this ancient and yet still profoundly relevant text has to say. But uh, I, I want to start by just thinking of the fact that actually it must be quite grim being famous. I don't know whether you, this is something you aspire to or you know people who are really sort of A-listers or A-triple-plus listers. You know, those who are really sort of global brands almost, those who are sort of constantly recognized, constantly paparazzied, you know, getting your phone tap, your, your face plastered on the front page of the tabloids, you name it. Now, I guess there are, there are probably bonuses to this. You, I guess, have immediate access to the best restaurants in London and New York and places, or uh, you can get Harrods, especially open for you as uh, after hours, as actually apparently Michael Jackson once did. Um, all kinds of benefits, but still, can you imagine the awkwardness of expecting people to recognize you, because in most places they do, and then suddenly finding people who, who don't? And so on the tip of your tongue are those excruciating but fateful words, don't you know who I am? It's embarrassing for everybody. Now, sometimes failing to recognize somebody important actually can have serious consequences, especially if it's done deliberately and that person has some kind of authority. So, you know, imagine you see a blue light in your rear view mirror. You know what that means. You know what kind of authority that represents. It's not so much someone who has fame, but who, someone who has uh, power. But uh, imagine, you know, sort of in a blood rush, you, you, you put your foot down and sort of steam off. It's not ideal. Well, in tonight's episode, this uh, section of Jesus' short story collection, we see that it's all about recognizing authority. His. Jesus of Nazareth, this carpenter who came from uh, the northern part of what was then uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, and yet claimed to have authority. In fact, he claimed to have a unique authority that truly shows us what it means to be human. He is the one who, who claims to be able to define what it means to be human, which is an extraordinary thing. But it is, of course, the reason why 2,000 years after he was walking the earth, we are meeting in a tent in the middle of a field in winter in Durham, thinking about who he is. But the story starts with people who assumed they had authority over Jesus. And uh, he enrages them. He enrages them. Uh, I want you to picture the scene. Jesus had arrived into Jerusalem, and uh, there's been quite the fanfare just a few days before, and uh, he intended to be noticed, and he was noticed. It's what down the centuries came to be known as Palm Sunday. It was quite a kind of sort of deliberate sort of campaign trail, if you like. Uh, you can read all about that in the previous chapter in, in Luke 19. And then at the end of this sort of triumphal entry, as it was called, uh, he proceeds to the temple, the heart of Jewish religion, where there are all kinds of sort of businesses that are set up, you know, around people came as pilgrims from all over the then known world. And so there were people there to change money. There was sort of foreign exchange bureau, as well as people selling all kinds of different things to sacrifice. So there was quite a sort of cottage industry. And Jesus sort of provocatively just sort of turns the whole thing up. He sort of turns tables over and kicks people out. It's incredibly provocative. You could be forgiven for thinking that he's quite mad. And it's certainly not what many people expect of Jesus, especially perhaps if they've considered and even appreciated some of his teaching. This seems very strange. And yet here we are at the beginning of uh, chapter 20. We're back at the scene of the crime. Do you see there in, in the, the beginning of the chapter? Jesus is teaching in the temple courts, the very place he had thrown over these tables. So it's no surprise, is it, in verse 2, that the authorities, well, they, they at least want to have a word with him. They probably want to do a little bit more than that, but, 
but they at least want to talk to him. And, and, you know, their question is exactly the right question. It's totally reasonable. By what authority are you doing these things? In other words, just who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That's a great question for Jesus. Uh, Nicky was encouraging us to keep asking questions. That's a great question to start with. Who do you think you are? Perhaps it's a common question for Christians. Perhaps you're thinking of that of the, the, the Durham CU. Who do you think you are putting on all this sort of stuff and expecting us to pitch up? But when people ask Jesus questions, he gives as good as he gets. We saw that on Monday evening, if you were here. And he throws it back, but it's ingenious. He seems to be dodging it, but he knows exactly what he's, what he's doing. Do you see there in verse 3? He says, I'm going to ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or was it human? Now, that's not plucked at random. It's very shrewd, very canny. Jesus' ministry was closely tied to John's. Uh, so if you like, Jesus, uh, John was the warm-up, warm up, and Jesus the main act. But more importantly, it catches these leaders on the hop. You see, John was popular. And so they discuss it amongst themselves. They realize this is a trap. If we say from heaven, he's going to ask, well, then why didn't you believe him? Because John the Baptist actually had rather a grisly end. He was arrested, in the end, was beheaded. It's a fair point. They, 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 they've understood. But do you see, for them, the alternative is too difficult to contemplate? They're terrified of popular opinion, and so they're stumped. Even if they did accept that John was from heaven, well... They're never going to admit it. Why? Because that would jeopardize their own authority. Vested interests are more important to them than truth, even God's truth. I understand the political dilemma that they face. I understand it, but still they chicken out. Which is why in verse 7, do you see down there? Their answer is, quite frankly, pathetic. We don't know. Jesus has completely mastered the situation. And people still follow the example, don't they? Of course, ignorance is perfectly reasonable. Nicky was mentioning about the importance of doubt. And sometimes doubt is a very necessary part of the process of trying to figure out what you actually believe. And ignorance is not culpable unless we don't try and do something about it. We don't try to overcome it, try to, to find out an answer. Now, that might take ages, might take years. Well, that's okay. That's life. But if sitting on the fence is just an excuse, well, that's not okay. Okay. Who is this Jesus? Does, just who does he think he is? Do you know what authority he holds? Don't just shrug it off with a limp, oh, I don't know. But Jesus knows exactly what these guys are thinking. And so in the, in the, he tells this story. And it's a story of authority usurped. It has a very contemporary feel, actually. Uh, think of some sort of big shot owner of factories scattered around the world, uh, and you begin to get the idea. Uh, now, I've no idea what your politics are. I guess it's pretty sort of varied across all the different people in the tent tonight. But if you're left of center, then you'll have to think outside the box for a little bit and just momentarily put yourselves in the shoes of a boss. I mean, Jesus' stories normally come from the perspective of the worker. Most of them seem to, but this is on the boss's side of the desk. And so here we have a guy who lays out for himself a particularly fine-looking vineyard. 
and he hires tenant farmers to look after it, as, as you would. Uh, see that in verse 9. And then he's jetting off to, to businesses elsewhere. He's got plenty of things to juggle. And it's reasonable for any investor to expect at least some, if not the majority, of any returns on the investment. These tenants have a contract. But can you imagine? Can you imagine a world without email and Skype? I mean, it's hard, isn't it? But this is that world, and there is no alternative. If you want to find out what's going on, there is no alternative but to send agents to find out and do uh, collect the rent. So, here we go. These, uh, 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 this boss uh, has his rights, and he has tenants who owe him. But for them, the boss's absence did not grow fonder hearts. Verse 10, first agent, they beat him up and send him away empty-handed. Verse 11, another servant, they beat him up, they treat him shamefully, whatever that means, they send him empty-handed. Verse 12, a third, they wound him and they throw him out. I mean, this is worthy of Quentin Tarantino. This is violence. And the violence degenerates each time. It gets worse. They're getting more and more brazen. Eventually, the owner has one option left. Verse 13, what what am I going to do? I'll send my son whom I love. Perhaps, perhaps, they'll respect him. It's deeply affecting. I'd even say it's one of the Bible's most poignant um, lines. I mean, at best, it seems naive after all that's happened. It's tragic. I wonder what you make of this owner. But then it gets really dark. When the tenants see the sun, they talk the matter over. Do you see that there? Verse 14, this is the heir. Let's kill him. And then the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What on earth is going on? Do they honestly imagine that the owner suddenly is going to add them to his will after this? No, of course, that's not the logic. They recognize that the owner's son is the last resort. So all they need to do now is just sit tight, wait till the owner cops it, and then the vineyard's theirs. It's squatter's rights. They kill the son, and they're sitting pretty. But think about this. What's more surprising, or rather, whose behavior is more surprising? The tenants or the owner? Why doesn't the owner evict the tenants after, well, after the first agent has been beaten up? I mean, that's pretty bad. I mean, my guess is that most of us here live in rented accommodation. Can you imagine if, you know, your landlord sends an agent round asking for rent, if it's not done by direct debit or something, and and you beat him up, what's going to happen? I mean, the police would be around imminently, wouldn't they? And you'd be out. No second chances. This is not the kind of tenant I want. No second chances let alone fifth chances. Yet Jesus' landlord gives them chance after chance after chance. Each time giving them the opportunity to do the right thing. Which they resolutely ignore. That's remarkable patience, isn't it? And perhaps gullibility. But it's pretty implausible, isn't it? I mean, what landlord is like that? Does anyone else here have a landlord like this? 
So Jesus inevitably asks there in verse 15, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, please, don't get distracted by the sort of summary justice here. You know, perhaps you dismiss this as a sign of a, an uncivilized and dark historical world. Well, well, stop for a moment. Put yourself in the owner's shoes. Would you not want justice of some sort? Would you not be owed justice of some sort? And a key principle of justice is the punishment fits the crime. I mean, justice, this, it's a cry from the heart. I've got two teenage kids, but since they were first speaking, they pretty much their first words is, Dad, that's not fair. <laughs> it's a common enough cry. But we can understand the desire, but kill the tenants? Perhaps that's too harsh for modern ears, and we're more enlightened than that. But, of course, this is just a story. But hang on, perhaps some of you are a little impatient now. What on earth has this story got to do with Durham in 2018? Well, before you shrug it off, let's just first think about how it impacted its first hearers and how it might have been relevant to them, because I think this is instructive. Look in verse 19, just over the page. The leaders knew... He had spoken this parable, this short story, about them. Now the question is, how? How do they know it's about them? (laughs) Was it just paranoia? Did they just assume that Jesus had it in for them? I, I mean, it's serious because... Their conclusion from from this understanding is that they then want to arrest Jesus and kill him. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Just within, well, hours, a few days of this moment, that is exactly what they are doing. He is arrested, put under a kangaroo court, and executed on a cross. As a result of these people who are questioning him right now. So the question is, how did they know, or what led them to assume that it was about them? Well, let's see if we can identify this authority. I want to read to you some very ancient words that come from about seven centuries, about 700 years or so, before Jesus lived from a man called Isaiah, one of the great Jewish prophets in the Jewish scriptures. Now, I want you to keep this parable in Luke open in front of you as I read, and just see if you can spot any correlations, and see if it rings any bells. It's from Isaiah chapter 5, and it goes like this. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, as you would. I mean, that's why you plant a vineyard, isn't it? You want grapes to make wine. But it yielded only bad fruit. Isaiah goes on, now you dwellers in Jerusalem, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do. I will take away its hedge and the vineyard will be destroyed. And it ends with these words, the vineyard of God Almighty, the Lord Almighty, is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Do you begin to see what's going on here? Do you begin to sense why Jesus is telling the story? Or rather, what inspires the story? He's, he's deliberately taking an ancient parable, an ancient short story, and updating it a little bit. 
So let's do a little bit of detective work. If, if that helps us to understand this short story in Luke, well, who is the owner? Well, it's obviously God himself. Who are the tenants? Well, presumably Israel's religious leaders. Their job was to cultivate the people of Israel so that they produce the fruit of a God-centered life. But when the tenants seem as self-centered as this lot, what hope is there? Well, then who are the agents, the servants who get sent? Well, anyone who knew their Old Testament back then would immediately recognize what this is about. These are those prophets, those speakers on God's behalf that he's been sending century over century to call the people back to God, to call them to the fruit of righteousness and justice that they were meant to show. That was the fruit. They were the grapes that this vineyard was built to produce. And actually, if you know a little bit of Old Testament history, you know that these prophets actually had a fate not that different from the servants in Jesus' story. And the son, whom I love, perhaps they'll respect him, Well, no prizes for guessing. Jesus is talking about himself. And the leaders get it immediately. You see, he's actually using this story to defend his actions from just a couple of days before. What authority did he have to turn over these money changers' tables in the temple? Well, this authority, because he's sent by the owner of the vineyard. He's God's son. He's God's last resort, the one that God loved. And yet whom God was willing to send to murderous tenants. What authority does he have? Heavens. Now, once we've grasped that, there's something else even more mind-boggling to get our heads around. Jesus is a threat to these religious leaders' authority. So follow the logic. It's as if by killing God's son, they would then control the people without being troubled by God anymore. I mean, that is bonkers, isn't it? That's just nuts. Yet according to the parable, that's their motive for killing the son so they can get hold of the vineyard. But here's the point. It seems to indicate that they know exactly who he is. Because if they know that Jesus spoke the parable about them, it means they realize he spoke the parable about himself. They appear to know full well. Otherwise, according to the parable's logic, why kill him? It's like speeding up to avoid the police, precisely because you know they have the authority to nick you. You see the blue light in the mirror, so you speed up. These people want to kill Jesus, precisely because he's a threat to their own authority. But if Jesus is the rightful heir of Israel, he is so much more. He's the Lord and creator of everything. That's the claim. He's the one that God has sent to restore the world to himself, the cosmos, everything that's wrong in the world, he's come to repair. He's the one who knows truly what it means to be human because he knows what humans were made to be because he was the one who made us. So here's the catch. Who does Jesus think he is? The Lord, the Lord, our Lord, my Lord, your Lord, whether you recognize it or not. That's what he's claiming. And I don't know about you, but I don't like that very much. I don't like that. I'd be surprised if anyone here was completely comfortable with that. So we have an incentive to reject him, don't we? So I don't, I don't want that. 
or, or an incentive at least to, to sit on the fence. I, I'm, I'm not going to decide just yet. By what authority, Jesus? We shrug. Oh, I, I don't know. Might be that genuine. Might be just an excuse. Uh, the brilliant philosopher and novelist of books like Brave New World, uh, amongst others, Aldous Huxley. Uh, he said this around 70 years ago. He said, I had a motive for not wanting the world to have meaning and consequently assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. For myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. Do you see the point? He chose this philosophy because what he felt it enabled him to do, which was whatever he wanted. Well, this is actually what the Bible calls sin. But bear with me for a moment. Erase sort of tabloid caricatures of the word. You know, forget the sex scandals or the political sleaze. You know, all of that stuff. Sin is only indirectly related to that, actually. The best working definition I, I have for it is, is that sin is living in God's world as if it was my world. Or to, to paraphrase Jesus' story, it's living as vineyard owners when actually we're only tenants. It's ideas above our station. It's profoundly unjust and insulting. It's based on untruth. It's about taking credit for things I've no right to. It's about ingratitude. It's about rejecting reality. It's deliberate, independent-mindedness. Is that right? Should that be allowed to continue like that? But didn't you sympathize with the owner at all? I'll send my son. Perhaps they'll respect him. But many presume we don't need to give Jesus a moment's thought. We think we can consign him as a, as a relic of history, fit only for a dust-covered museum. Well, that is entirely your prerogative to think that. You're entirely free to think that if you want. But as we've been at pains to show uh, morning and evening this week, he's far more than a relic of history. C.S. Lewis, uh, the great creator of Narnia, who, he, he wrote a number of books, but he, he wrote this very importantly. He said, One must keep on pointing out that Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. That becomes clear as you see how Jesus closes out this discussion. After telling the story, people object. They don't like it. They give him a hard time. Perhaps you do. But here's the final surprise of the evening. Jesus exposes the folly of that, again, by going back to the Jewish scriptures. He says, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. What on earth does that mean? What does that mean? Well, initially... I don't know whether this describes how you thought about it, um, but initially Jesus doesn't seem to be very much. I mean, it's an interesting thing. If you've come every night, um, Nat has asked the question, what, 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 would you, what, what is Jesus to you? And uh, each night we've heard different people talk about what they used to think and how they now think. And for many people, most people, it's as if, well, he wasn't very much. He was sort of maybe quite interesting or they just didn't know. Jesus, to begin with, at least for many, just seems not that important. Like a piece of rubble that you just throw into a skip. Plenty of those on a building site. 
the sort of person you can neutralize or crucify or just ignore. And indeed, when Jesus dies on a cross, which you can read about in the subsequent chapters in Luke, chapters 22 and 23, when Jesus dies, well, I mean, we can see why people ignore him. I mean, what, he claims to be a king. What sort of kings get executed? Well, failed ones. But the story doesn't stop there. He was rejected, yes, but God made him the cornerstone, as it says there in verse 17. The most important stone in the arch, the one that holds it up. How? By defeating his defeat, by rising to to life after death. If that's something you've never encountered, then come along tomorrow lunchtime. We'll be thinking precisely about that question. He rose from the dead. He defeated death. And so proved himself the Lord he claimed to be. He proved his authority. He is the Lord. But here's the amazing thing. He's the Lord, but he's no dictator. He's not out to control people or manipulate or abuse or exploit He's a God of unique mercy, a God truly of love, as Nikki discovered for herself. And because his death on a cross prevents him from having to cast anybody out of the vineyard if they come to him, he doesn't want to do that. This is my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. Perhaps they will love him. But he knows that they won't. He knows that they will kill him, and he knows that he will go through with it. And he does it because he loves Jesus died that we might be forgiven for this sin. This living in the vineyard as if we're the owners and not the tenants. He knows us. He knows our independent mindedness. And yet he sticks with us. He still wants us on his team. He's willing to go to the cross to do that. Does it seem too good to be true? I know there were definitely times when I felt that. But Jesus is so good precisely because he is true. Now, there will definitely be some here tonight who who really need to chew more on this. Perhaps, you know, you've never heard anything quite like this until this week. Well, I'm thrilled you're here. That's great. Take as much time as you need. There are no timetables on this. If you need time to think, to question, to really wrestle with it, do it. Do it. That's great. Uh, There's a course, a a, a group coming up. There'll be information about it in a moment. It's called The Search. Sign up for that. Talk to your friends. Maybe check out a church in Durham. Sit on the fence as long as necessary. That's okay. But please, please have integrity as you sit on the fence. Don't let the fence be an excuse because, of course, that is in itself a choice. But others, maybe maybe there are some who are all too conscious of the truth of living in God's world without dependence on God, just giving God lip service, but you really want to do something about it. For a few, you perhaps might need help in doing that. Perhaps it's a really scary thing. Perhaps you're sort of teetering on the edge and thinking, what am I thinking? This is just too big. Well, you're not alone. When I was 18, I had to make this decision, and I was scared. I didn't really, I had to sort of get my head around it, and it it just felt huge. I can say quite safely now, I'm, you know, nearly 30 years later, I don't look back on it. It's the best thing I ever did. So for those who just need that little nudge, just to, to, to you know, make that commitment, I, I want to say a prayer. This is by no means wanting to twist or manipulate anybody. It's just that I'm pretty sure there'll be some people for whom this is just, just where they're at. 
There's no magic words. It's not a formula. You don't have to get the words exactly right. That's not how it works. It's about where your heart is before God. So I'm going to say some words that are just a suggestion. Put it in your own words. That's even better. But so that I'm not putting words into your mouth, I'm going to put them on the screen and just read through them first before I pray them so that you can see what it is you might be letting yourself in for. This is what I'm going to pray in a moment. Lord God, I'm so sorry that I've not loved you with all my heart, soul, mind and strength. I understand now who Jesus is and why he died. I know that I do not deserve it. But because of Jesus' death on a cross for me, I ask you to forgive me. From now on, please give me the desire to obey you and help me follow Jesus, whatever the cost. Amen. Not magic words. They're not particularly special words. They're not poetic. But for some, they might be just the words you need. So just as a respect to all of those, let's just um, bow our heads and I'll lead us in prayer. And if this is you, just echo it quietly in your heart before God. Lord God, I am so sorry that I have not loved you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I understand now who Jesus is and why he died. I know that I do not deserve it. But because of Jesus' death on a cross for me, I ask you to forgive me. From now on, please give me the desire to obey you and help me to follow Jesus, whatever the cost. Amen. Now, if that's something you did, I would love to meet you. I'd love to talk with you, uh, give you a book, and uh, just get your name so that I can be praying for you. And uh, see where we go from there. But wherever you are, I, whatever the sort of situation you're in, whatever you think, I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad you've stuck it through tonight. You've had the patience to listen very quietly and politely to me. I appreciate that. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much for coming. And do come and talk to me if you have questions. Thanks for listening.